So we're reading this morning then from Hebrews chapter number 3. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who is faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful to all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. In the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works forty years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said they do always err in their heart, they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Albeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Early 20th century Presbyterian evangelist Wilbur Chapman, he told the story of Leonardo da Vinci's painting The Last Supper. Leonardo was eager to find a young man whose life was pure enough so that he could sit for Leonardo as he would seek to paint the face of Christ. Now, if you were here a few weeks ago, uh, Tom's views reflect my views, so I'm sharing this as a story to you. So Leonardo was looking for a model, a face that, in his estimation, would somehow uh, represent the face of the Son of God. And so he searched, and after a significant period, he found a youth by the name of Pietro Bandandelli, this man was a chorister in one of the churches in Rome, and apparently he had a radiant face and a beautiful face, and so that face would become the face of Christ in uh, da Vinci's painting. Years passed, and the painting was still unfinished. All the other disciples had been portrayed in that picture except one Judas Iscariot. And so da Vinci began again the search for a face, and this time he was looking for a face that was hardened by sin. He's looking for a face that was contorted by lust and evil desire. And so, on one occasion in the streets of Rome, he found this dissolute beggar with a face that was so villainous that he shuddered at even the, the sight of him. He said, there's my Judas Iscariot, so he hired him. And he hired him to sit as he painted the face of Judas on the canvas. And when he was finished with the, the rendering, before he dismissed the man, he said, I have yet to find out your name. And the man looked at him and said, I am Pietro Bandandelli. I once sat as your model for Jesus Christ. I don't know how authentic the story is, but what I do know, what I do know is the fact that sin hardens. Sin hardens men and women to the point where it cannot be hidden upon their face. This morning I want to draw your attention to a simple phrase, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13 but in order to capture the context, let's read verse 12, 13, and 14 together once again. Again, notice the address. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So my theme this morning is hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. 
The first thing I point out to you here is this text tells us something of sin's nature. It speaks about the deceitfulness of sin. And you see, one of the great benefits, one of the great blessings of the Scripture is that the Word exposes the real character of sin. And here it's described as being deceitful in character. And you know, if it were not for the Word to tell us that sin is deceitful, we'd never believe it because sin never, sin never appears as it really is. Think with me, if you will, for a few moments of the way that sin seeks to deceive Sin deceives, first of all, as to its nature. In other words, sin rarely appears as temptation in your life and says, Here I am in all my hideousness. Now it always comes decked out in another garment that never appears as it is. It presents itself in another dress than its own. And so sin sometimes appears as something that is advantageous. We go back to the Garden of Eden, remember... We think of Adam and Eve and the deception. We think of the sin. We think of the fall. Remember what sin looked like from Eve's vantage point? Ye shall be as gods. Now we look on the other side and see the hideousness of it. But remember what Eve saw. She saw the deceitfulness of sin. From her vantage point, ye shall be as gods. Herein lies the principal strength of temptation. Sin in its nature, sin always hides its nature from those minds that are being exercised by it. And so Eve, she did not see the nature of sin. What she saw was this this suggestion, ye shall be as gods. All she could see was advantage. She couldn't see misery. She couldn't see pain. She did not see guilt. She did not see carnage. All she could see was opportunity. And friends, sin is so deceitful. And don't expect sin to appear as it is because it never does. We're talking about the deceitfulness of sin. You remember Achan, the story of Achan, whenever the Israelites conquered the city of Jericho. When Achan was told that the spoil of Jericho was to be devoted unto God, it was not to be something that you're to take into your possession. Achan disobeyed God, but I tell you what did Achan see? Achan didn't see wretchedness. Achan didn't see the loss of possessions. Achan didn't see the death of his children. Achan didn't see the death of his wife. Achan didn't see the death of himself. What did he see? He saw an opportunity for improvement. That's the way sin appeared to Achan. And from that viewpoint, it looked like a good prospect to gain wealth. Child of God, get it firmly placed in your mind that sin is a deceitful thing. It never appears as it really is. It puts on some other garb. And oftentimes it just appears to be opportunity. Sin sometimes looks like an opportunity to gain pleasure. So we see something very desirable, something apparently very pleasurable. But again, remember that sin in its nature is deceitful. Sin sometimes appears to be an opportunity to gain not only pleasure, gain finance, or to gain stature, or to gain respect, or to gain satisfaction, or to gain gratification, to gain happiness. This is what it appears. This is what we see when we fall subject to temptation. We don't see sin as it is. It's a mercy that the Lord comes along and He shows us the true nature of sin. You know, sin is not like the simple mouse trap. To the mouse, it looks like a cheese buffet and it's free. And who would be so daft as to put a nice piece of cheese or to leave it right out here in the open? And fishermen don't usually fish with a naked hook. There's got to be some attraction. There's got to be some attraction that would draw the unwary in. And usually the attraction effectively conceals the hook, but the hook is always there. And child of God, get it into your mind with sin. The hook is always there. It's always attractive because sin by its nature is attractive. It's deceitful. And if you want to understand how inclined we are to go after the attraction for getting the hook... I don't know if there's a better picture of that than there is in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 7. Proverbs chapter 7, you see one who saw the bait, forgot about the hook. 
You've got this one young simple man who is being seduced by the fair speech of the adulteress. It says in verse 22, He goeth after her straightway. Why did he go after? Why would he be so insane as to go after her? With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield the flattering of her lips. She forced him. There's the attraction. There's the seduction. That's what sin is. Sin is is seducing. And so he goes after her straightway. Notice the hook as an ox goeth to the slaughter. And friend, when we then fall prey to temptation, we go as an ox to the slaughter. Here's this dumb beast has no concept of the fact that as it's being channeled down into this walkway, that it's going to be channeled for the last time. It is for his life. So let me ask you, are you being deceived by sin in your life? Have you forgotten that the Bible describes sin as being a deceitful thing? It's deceitful then in its appearance. It's deceitful also in its promises. Because sin promises several things. Let me suggest to you three of the most common temptations. The first is that sin promises satisfaction. If you live in sin, you will be satisfied. That's the temptation that we face. This idea that there's going to be satisfaction if we fall into sin. Compare the scriptures, Isaiah 57, 20, but the wicked are like a troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. dirt, dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And so there's the promise of satisfaction, but that satisfaction, because sin is deceitful, never comes. And so the world's words then are suggested by its performers, there is no satisfaction. I can't get satisfaction. Now, what about an instance where somebody says, well, I am satisfied by sin. In fact, it is satisfying me quite much. That may be, but my explanation would be they may be satisfied by sin because they're still living, as it were, on deferred payments. We're going to get to the terms of sin in a few moments. The sin will always come to collect and if you're enjoying sin today, and if you're finding satisfaction, and you're living on deferred payments, there's going to come a day where the balance is due. The sin always comes to collect. It deceives in its promise of satisfaction. It deceives in its promise of pleasure. If you live in sin, the second temptation would be, if you live in sin, you will enjoy life. So there's this idea that Christianity, that righteous, that holy living, it's, it is oppressive, it is... Uh, it's miserable, it leads me to just to waste my days. If you live in sin, you will enjoy life. Who's going to argue with that? The Bible says as much. It talks about the pleasures of sin. Sin is a very pleasurable thing. You know why? Because your flesh is built to enjoy sin. Read Galatians 5. Out of your flesh, notice the things that come out of your flesh. If you find sin attractive, you ought to find sin attractive in your flesh because your flesh is in love with sin. And sin spews out of your flesh. Again, of course you're going to live and enjoy sin. Remember what Moses had. He had foresight and he had faith to know that the pleasures of sin are seasonable. That is, they're short-lived. Stop and think of the pleasures of sin as they are to be seen upon the faces of the people with which you live as you mark the decade. The sin in the 20s seems to be pretty attractive, right? There's youth, there's vigor, there's life. There's all kinds of things that mark enjoyment. That's the reason why the advertisement agencies of this country, they market youth because youth has an attraction to it. And then you go to the 30s. And whereas certain behaviors is acceptable in the 20s and may even be enjoyable looking, when you get to the 30s, it starts to get a little old. You get to 40. The sin starts to look very different at 40. We were back up to Canada not so long ago and we ran into some of our friends who have been living in sin and traction in 20s. They have their life to live. Still in that world at 40? Starts to look pretty old. Start to see the marks on their face. Get to 50. Get to some of the most famous classic rockers in 50 and 60. They look like they stepped out of the casket. Because sin is starting to, is starting to age them. 
that they look lived and they look worn. If you live in sin, you'll enjoy life. Friends, if you're enjoying sin today, don't be surprised because your flesh loves it. But remember that your enjoyment is seasonable and your summer is going to be over. Your summer will soon be over and it will be gone. The sin deceives as it's to its promises. It promises liberty. If you live in sin, you'll be free. That's probably the worst lie of all. I'm going to be free. The Bible says if you live in sin, you'll not be free. You're going to be snared. In fact, whoever commits sin is the bond slave of sin. Sin does not give liberty. Sin enslaves and it brings death. And one sin will follow another until the individual is snared and cannot get loose. And if you talk to anybody who has struggled with addiction, they will tell you. They will tell you that the promise to liberty is a lie. It's a lie from the pit. It's a lie from the one who is the father of the lies. It doesn't promise liberty at all. What it brings is a greater ensnarement. The sin deceives as to its nature. Sin deceives as to its promises. Sin deceives as to its power. See, sometimes people think that sin is just an act. You know, a sinful act. But sin is much more than an act. Sin is a power. And sin promises to be satisfied with a limited indulgence. In other words, I can take just a little bit and it's gonna, it'll be fine. I talked several weeks ago to somebody who's struggling with alcoholism and a person who told me that for the longest time they reasoned within themselves the possibility of limited indulgence. You know, I can take a little bit, it's going to be okay. But alcoholism is just one example of how sin cannot be satisfied with limited indulgence. Sin will flatter a man with the notion that he can go just so far and no further and then he can return back whenever he wants. But sin is like that horse leech in the book of the Proverbs that's it says, give, give. And what's the, what's the significance? The horse leech has a, has, a double fork, has a forked tongue. And both parts of the tongue go in and they begin to suck like a leech would and begins to suck and suck and suck. And so sin is that same way. It has an insatiable appetite and so it's never content with just a little bit because when it gets a little bit, it wants a little bit more. And it gets more and it wants more and it wants more. And again, the drug addict illustrates how insatiable the appetite of sin becomes. I suppose about a year ago, now on a Saturday morning, I had a lady come to the church here who was coming down off a thousand dollar crack weekend bender. Jen slept since Wednesday. And she began to tell her life story, the saddest story you'll ever hear. She made a statement at the very beginning of her life when she got into drugs, she said, I can handle this. There's those drugs that this state would seek to legalize. Just simple things, right? Sin's never content with, with little. It takes more. It takes more. And I said, this is just an example. This is just an illustration. Sin will not stop until it completely ruins you. You may never be addicted to alcohol or to drugs, but don't lose sight of the fact that sin does not stop until it engulfs its prey. And in that sense, sin is much more than an act. It is a power. And Paul speaks of the power of sin in Romans 5 when he talks about sin reigning. And who reigns? A king reigns. A monarch reigns. And we talk about the sovereignty of God, but Paul talks about the sovereignty of sin. It reigns. It's not partial sovereignty. No, sin reigns as a monarch within its kingdom. And because we're the sons of Adam then, before regeneration, sin reigns in our hearts. Calvin said, sin plunged men under its power. And friends, thank God then for Christ's saving work, for it is only through His saving work. By the man hear the words of relief, for sin shall not have dominion. There's the word sovereignty. Sin will not have a sovereign rule over you. So Christ's saving work breaks the power of sin. It's not just an act, it's a power. But sin deceives you to that reality. The sin deceives men as to its terms. A couple of weeks ago, I was in a, a Walmart return line. There was a gentleman in front of me who was returning a PS or a PX90, I don't know what it was, video game system. He's returning it, and he was real excited until he was told, Sorry, sir, you must not have read the fine print. It was a 90-day term. He had to have it returned within the 90 days. 
Sin doesn't want you to read the fine print. I was sharing with somebody recently how that sin is much like making purchases on a, on a credit card. It seems to be a good idea at the time. You know, it's a lot easier to spend credit than it is to spend cash. That monthly bill comes along, it comes with a suitable finance charge, and you know that in terms of sin, it always has premium interest rates. Never mind Bank of America, sin's rates are worse. Sin is always a bad deal. And yet the devil, unlike or not unlike the credit agencies of this country, they want you to have 10 V's as they want you to run your credit limit. He extends big lines of credit. He gives you the most attractive financing options and it's always, of course, deferred payment. Just keep buying and buying and buying. Run up your limit. And sin like some credit card agencies will actually trick you into thinking you're saving money. And in fact, you're going down and you're losing it in an alarming way. With credit cards, you can defer the payments, but friends, you know that the time of reckoning comes and you will pay. Likewise, sin always comes to collect and sin's collection agency is has impeccable statistics in terms of recovery. They never fail to collect. Romans 6 and 25 puts it in a different illustration. And there we read that the wages of sin, now the wages, wages are something that we can lay claim to. If you were to work 40 hours and your employer was to say, well, I can't pay you, I'm not going to pay you, that's a violation. That's a violation because working those 40 hours in contract, you have a right to claim. So you've got a right to claim your wages. The wages of sin is death. That's what you've merited. That's what you've deserved. That's what your 40 years, your 50 years of sin has paid out. That's what you will collect. The wages of sin is death. But the gift, notice the transition. What's a gift? You can't lay claim to a gift. A gift is something that comes to you without merit. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin is deceitful because it deceives men as to the terms. I wonder, friend, are you way, way out, up to your neck in moral debt against God's holy law? And right now you're just hoping, you're hoping for an ongoing refinancing plan that will allow you to defer your payments just a little further. The sin's going to come and collect. And friends, when sin collects, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, eternal death. Don't be so deceived. Deceives also as to the excuses it suggests. Sin makes the most ridiculous excuses. I, I did it wrong, but what can you expect from a creature of flesh and blood? What can you expect from a human? We're all sinners. You ever notice how that today sinners talk as if they're the victim, not the offender? I've been victimized. You see the folly in children, perhaps more apparently. I did this because, and it always is a justifiable reason that would explain why they've just clobbered their sibling over the head. When I get that explanation coming, I always say, just, just stop for a second and, and think, are you going to find an explanation that is going to give you justification for doing what you just did? There's never going to be justification suitable. Such is the deceivableness of sin that it makes itself out to be worthy of praise. Here I'm guilty of the very thing and now I'm seeking to be congratulated on account of it. And it deceives us by making us feel that our case is hopeless. The devil is not a, is not a being of comfort. What he wants is you to be in total despair. He wants you to be in total despair so when you have taken that hook, or taken the bait and now feeling the hook... The temptation will be to hear his insinuation. Well, now you've done it. Now, you, now you're finished. There's no escape. I'm sorry you're stuck with the debt and we don't refinance. And so the idea of forgiveness, the idea of beginning a new life, it's absurd because sin deceives you into thinking that your situation is absolutely hopeless. And even the backslider, one has professed faith in Christ, he feels he can never turn back. Backslider, are you being so deceived today? You've, you've fallen into sin in a great way and you know it. 
And he got this feeling that there's no way I can get back. There's no way I can get back on track. There's no way I can rebuild my life. The sin will deceive you by making you feel that your case is hopeless. And that there is no way forward. Friends, the hope for you today is that God's word is given to us in mercy to expose the character of sin. It deceives us. We notice sin's nature. We notice also sin's effects. Notice again our verse, verse 13, but exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And professing child of God, that word hardened should, should cause you fear. We're not talking about hardness of face, although sin does show on your countenance after a while. Look at chapter 4 and verse 7. The book of Hebrews. Today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. What he's talking about here is the hardness of heart. And hardness of heart is insensitivity. The sin makes people insensitive. I'm not talking about people being insensitive in that emotional way, but in a spiritual way. It makes your heart, it makes the, the seat of sensitivity, that, that heart within, makes it insensible. Insensible to what? Let me suggest to you in the passage here, that sin makes people hard or insensitive to God's voice. Look at verse number 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear His voice, notice the word if, stop and think about the mercy of the voice of God. So here's God's covenant people living in the middle of heathendom. And He gives His word, He gives His voice unto His own. He speaks through the prophets speaks through the priesthood, speaks through the sacrificial system. He's speaking. Dear friend, do not ever underestimate the privilege of a God who speaks. They heard His voice. Look at verse number 16. For someone they had heard did provoke. They had become hardened to the voice of God and so they heard and they heard and they heard the preached word, they heard the sacramental word through the the sacrifice, they heard the word. But they provoked because their heart had become hardened to that word. It reminds me of a verse that we looked at back in our study in the book of Proverbs on Wednesday nights. What a description you've got here of Israel. Maybe this is a description of your life. Proverbs 29 and 1, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Let me ask you, are you here today and you've heard the word of God? Listen to the mercy. He that being often reproved, that's mercy. And God sends many reprovers into sinners' lives. They're reproved by others. They're reproved by the church. They are reproved by ministers of the gospel. They're reproved by parents. They are reproved by the admonitions of His Word and the promptings of His Spirit. They're reproved by providences, hard and sharp providences. They're reproved. What mercy that one should be often reproved. There's people today that have never experienced the reproof of the gracious God. They've never experienced what you have experienced. He that being often reproved. Notice, he that being often reproved hardens his neck. This is the same word that's in Hebrews chapter 4. The metaphor is taken from oxen who will kick and toss about and will not allow the yoke to be placed upon their neck. God describes his people through the prophet Jeremiah, they're unaccustomed to the yoke. That is, that they're not broken. They will refuse to let the yoke be put upon them and so they get stiff-necked. And all the way through the Old Testament, we read about the people of God. They were a stiff-necked people. They would not be brought under the restraints of God. And so you've been told, you've been preached at, your parents have told you, this pulpit has told you, your Sunday school teachers have told you, you've been often reproved and you will not be restrained. You will not be brought down. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed. 
That verse tells us that divine patience will have its end. Notice the word suddenly. How many times do we see the sudden end of the patience of God unto those who had been reproved? Think of Pharaoh. Moses comes to him ten times. Let my people go. And he would not allow the yoke of the word of God to be placed upon him. And so his heart is hardened. And how suddenly then when the waters of the Red Sea come down upon him, he was destroyed suddenly. What about Eli's sons? What about Ahab? Ahab goes to battle. Ahab knows uh, some suspicion that he probably shouldn't be in this battle and is fearful for his life, so he puts on the attire of another man because he's afraid of what might happen. The Bible says in God's providential ways that a man drew a bow at a venture. In other words, just in a haphazard way, he draws a bow. And there's nothing haphazard in the purpose of God. Here's a man who had often been reproved by Micaiah, the prophet of God. And that arrow came right through and suddenly Ahab was gone. Perhaps the most fearful words are here. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed. And that without remedy. That's without healing, without repair. It means no cure. That means no pardon. That means no recovery. That means you're now in an undone state, irretrievably lost. And Charles Bridges put it this way. He said, Thou art standing on mercy's ground between heaven and hell. Let me ask you, dear friend, today, is that where you're standing? On mercy's ground between heaven and hell. You've been often reproved. And to this date, you've hardened your neck. You ever notice the difference in in a gathering like this? Of the hardness of the men's hearts and at the same time the sensitiveness of other hearts. You know, people always say when you stand at the front you see a lot of things. For those of you who are prone to sleeping in the service, I see you. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I had a, a 30 minute clip of your best moments. <laughs> one eye goes from one side to the other, you know. When I look down here, I see people who are, who are soaking up the Word. There's a sensitivity. I'm not calculating in my mind, but I, I'm conscious of the fact that some of you soak up the Word. The Word is received by you. You're tender-hearted. And others of you, I have to go to the encouragement that was given unto Jeremiah. Don't be afraid of their faces. Because your heart. The last thing you want to hear is me speaking to you. Sometimes it comes through in your account that you can't stand me. I see it. I'm okay with it. I'm okay if you, don't, you can't stand me, but I'm more concerned if you can't stand God. And that's the reality. But you hate His Word. You will not be reproved by Him. And so you're told and you're told. Maybe you're like the Israelites who feigned that they received the Word of God and enjoyed it. They sat under Ezekiel. They came and they listened. They listened, but they did not do what He told them to do. Sin will harden you. Will you become insensitive to the voice of God? And friends, if you get to that stage where you just don't hear the voice of God anymore, I don't want you to be unnecessarily fearful because there's times even in a believer's life where it seems that God has been silent for a time. I would encourage you by saying this, that when God is silent unto a believer, He will immediately burst forth as a psalmist. Be not silent unto me, or I'd be like those that go down into the pit. I can't stand the silence. I I can't stand the silent treatment. Speak to me, O God, and thank God, God will speak. God speaks to His sheep and the sheep hear His voice. And that ought to be your design every Sunday. You come, Lord, speak to me. Let me hear your voice that I know that my heart would continue to be sensitive. Insensitive to God's words. Look at verse 9. Insensitive to God's works. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Now, how hard do you have to be? How hard do you have to be to be insensitive to the works of God? You stop and think of the works we're talking about. We're talking about the opening of the Red Sea. We're talking about the provision of manna from heaven for 40 years. How long? How mighty? And apparently no impression. 
That ought to scare you. That ought to scare me. But God could be so powerful, so mighty, and me be so little moved. It tells you the state of one's heart. I think of that description as given of the Gentiles in Ephesians 4. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Past feeling. In other words, there's no more sensitivity that's gone. Again, professing child of God, have you got to the place where you feel that you've lost your sensitivity to the works of God and people are moved by things? You're just, it's as if nothing could impress you. Again, I don't want you to unnecessarily doubt your salvation. But your prayer ought to be just like the psalmist, Lord, move my heart. Cause me to see wonderful things. Cause me to be moved upon afresh. And for those of you who are here today are not saved, what will it take? What will it take God to do for you to believe that His Word is true? If one were to come back from the dead this morning and take the position of this pulpit, Luke records that you wouldn't believe him. Luke 16 talks about Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man is in hell. And he's having dialogue here and he has concern for his five brothers who are still alive. And he says, look, send my brother, send one back to my five brothers for they're not saved. They need to be converted. Send one back. I said, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. That's how insensitive a human heart is. Then the, the resurrected Christ Speaking unto men, guess what? He faced the resistance of hard hearts. They did not believe. They would not believe. They were hardened to God's words. They were hardened to His works. Verse 6 and 7 here tells us that they were hardened to God's Son. You see, when you look in verse 7, it talks about His voice. I think you have to look at it in context here. Verse 1 talks about our High Priest and our Apostle Jesus Christ. Verse 6 again but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Wherefore, today if you will hear his voice. Now we know that the voice of Christ is the voice of God. He is the word. But my, it brings in a redemptive quality when we see that voice as being the voice of the son. In the book of Lamentations, the question is asked, is it nothing to you all you that pass by and see my sorrow? That there's no sorrow like my sorrow. It's, it's nothing to you. You know, it's an amazing thing. If you look at the cross and you see the polarity of emotions around the cross, think of, think of the different kinds of emotions around Christ's cross. Think of Peter's feeling in his heart. What was going on in Peter? And he had caught that glance of the Lord and his heart had been broken. Think of Mary. Broken hearted, sensitive toward what was going on. Think of John, the beloved apostle. Think of the loyalty of Joseph of Arimathea who would very shortly ask for the body of Christ to receive it. And think of Pilate. Apparently insensitive that he should condemn an innocent man by his own admission. Think of the high priests who are breathing out like Paul once did threatenings and cursings. Think of the scribes and the Pharisees. Think of the Roman soldiers. Think of the fearful insensitivity around the cross of Christ where half of the crowd are broken and the other half are as steadfast as ever. Friends, that same reality is going to be around then the table that signifies that same cross work. So as we take the elements this morning, some of you, as you take the elements and then meditate upon what they mean, it'll bring brokenness of heart for you know that it was my sin that put Christ there. And then there are thousands, I dare say millions across this world, even under the guise of religion, that are taking the elements every day with a hardness of heart. My friend, this passage here tells us something very important. It tells us that going through the motions of religion, even good religion, 
except there be a work of grace upon the heart is not sufficient. So sin hardens us to God's voice and God's works and God's Son, but sin hardens us to sin itself. And that's why we don't see the sufferings of Christ to be worth being sensitive of because we don't understand the nature of sin. See how it comes full circle? Sin deceives us. When we're deceived by sin, we become hard. When we become hard, we're further deceived. J.C. Rowell once said, Christ is never fully valued until sin is clearly seen. And when you see sin for what it is, and you understand, you understand the nature that would be, even as that one in the Proverbs, that adulterous woman who takes a bite of the fruit and she wipes her mouth and she says, I have done no evil. Friends, when you clearly see what sin is, then you'll understand what I want you to point out to you next, and that is sin's danger. Look with me, if you will, briefly here at sin's danger. Look at verse number 12. Take heed, brethren. Take heed, brethren. Not take heed ungodly. Take heed heathen. Take heed, brethren. Now, brethren is a description of those who profess the name of Christ. It's a it's a title that speaks of a, there's a corporate entity to it, brethren. But in case we slip under a, a title that speaks of many, look at the next phrase. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you. How specific is the Word of God? And I wonder, does that you come to you today because you know that right now you're deceived and you're getting hard in your heart? And so notice sin's danger. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you. Again, our brother Tom touched upon it this morning. We believe in the doctrines of grace and we believe in what some people describe as being once saved, always saved. We believe that. We believe in the security of the saints. We believe that when a man is in the hands of Christ, he cannot be plucked from it. We believe that we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. But that eternal security must also then be understood in the light of these passages. Notice in verse 6, If we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope unto the end. In verse 14, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Remember in our series in Hebrews chapter 11, Back in Hebrews 10, 38, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. The danger of sin is that there can be those who are in the community, the visible church, those who have all of the, the religion on their mouths and on their hands and in their heart in some sense. Those are the very people who are susceptible. Take heed, brethren, lest any of you. What sin is most notorious? Is there any specific sin in this passage? Again, our brother Tom touched on it this morning. The sin is the sin of unbelief. Look at verse 12. Take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Verse 17, But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned? How did they sin? Verse 18, To whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? So we see then that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Our brother Tom pointed out this morning the unbelief being suggested here is the unbelief of the ten spies that came back and said, Look, we can't go into that land. The cities are walled up to heaven. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. We cannot go. We cannot go. This discouraging report brought back unbelief. And what did unbelief do? It made them question the veracity of the Word of God that says you can go. This land is your land. You go into this promised land. And the report comes back and says, no, we can't do it. And so, friend, I want you to see here that sin's danger brings you to the place where you will unbelieve God. That's the big problem. It's unbelief. Where your word, where the reports of other people become greater than God's word. God said to Adam and Eve, you shall surely die. The Satan said, no you won't really die. He didn't really mean that. Let me give you my interpretation of it. This whole book is about 
pressing on, being steadfast unto the end. And here's a verse, a chapter that speaks about turning back. I want you to see at the, at the root of all turning back. I say at the root of all backsliding is this sin right here. It's the sin of unbelief. Here is the very foundation of turning back. It's when we say, God, your word's not true. My opinion's better. Have you got to that place to exalt your opinion over the word of God? If you're in a dangerous place, take heed, brethren, less than any of you. I want you to notice the danger is suggested here by the next phrase in verse number 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But there is not a Jew. There is not a Jew who would ever suggest that their behavior was in the fact a departure from God. They might be departing from this and departing from that, but never departing from God. You see, the object of departure is from the living God. Friends, unbelief, sin. It's not something that we can do alongside of fellowship with God. We've seen that sin is something that is totally opposed to God so much so that if we pursue sin, we're going to be departing from the living God. Isn't every word of the Scripture meaningful from the living God, the God who gives life, the God who gives spiritual life, the God who gives eternal life? Are you departing from the living God? Let me end this morning then by looking at sin's answer. Hebrews 3.13 But exhort one another daily while it is called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. The important word here is lest. Hardness of heart is the consequence of neglecting the means for softening it. Lest. But exhort one another daily while it is called today lest. And so the answer then to the hardening of sin is Found here, I want you to notice what it says. It says, exhort one another daily. While it is called today, exhort one another. You know what that tells me? That tells me that there is an inseparable connection between my perseverance and grace and my connection with the local New Testament church. You cannot separate the two. We live in a day of individualism and we live in a day in a country that boasts its own independence and it has affected the minds of Christians who've lost sight of the fact that my perseverance and grace and the local church and my interaction with it are inseparably linked. And so when I just throw off church and decide, well, I'm not going to come to church anymore, I really don't need the fellowship of the saints, you're saying something very serious. It says, exhort one another. And so that tells me the word we use fellowship is much more than nice crock pots. And the fellowship of the saints is much more than having a nice display of drinks available for interaction and intermingling after the service. The fellowship of the saints is the body of Christ under the ordinances of the Son of God, empowered by the Holy Ghost, subject to one another, working through the means God has said, what for the preservation of God's people. And when we flee from the church, we are turning our back on the living God. And yet we look at church sometimes, well, I'm just going to leave it off. Friends, if you're struggling, there's no place you need to be more than in the house of God. It's not my sermons you need. It's not social interaction with some of the people you like, some of the people maybe you don't like. That's not what you need. It's what you need is a heart open to God. Lord, take these people through them. Through this, your church, make me a man of God. And keep me in the ways of truth. And when church gets boring to you, and when church me becomes meaningless to you, and you get nothing out of the sermon, by faith they hold upon this truth, exhort one another daily. Why? So that you don't go back under perdition. So we're to exhort one another. I want you to notice it says we're to exhort one another daily. And again, I think an attitude toward our interaction with the body is I need the body to come to Christ in those early formative stages, but now I know what I need to know, therefore I don't need to know anymore. But if I need to be exhorted daily, that tells me how fast sin can work. It works daily. If I need to be exhorted daily, then sin works every bit as fast. I need to be exhorted daily. The Lord calls us in mercy then to a Sabbath, to a, a corporate worship of the body once a week. And friend, I really believe in my heart, it's my conviction, that unless you're facing extenuating circumstances, that you should be in the house of God 
every single time the doors are open. That's my conviction. And that's not my conviction so that we can pad our finances. And that's not my conviction because I want our church to build a new building. My conviction is that you ought to be here because there's something very, very grand going on. It's the living God in the midst of His people. And when we lose sight of that, then we begin to see graphic illustrations in our own number of the very reality that Da Vinci saw when he came to paint two faces. And so we exhort one another daily and we're exhorting, it says here, while it is called today. Brother Tom brought out a great point this morning that today meant something back in the psalmist today in Psalm 95. And when the writer to the Hebrews takes it into Hebrews 3 and 4, he brings it right up to date today. Today's the moment. The truth of God has application to our day. In fact, we can take that word today and bring it right into April the 2nd, 2011, to exalt one another daily while it is called today. It means there's an opportunity. And you know, clay and wax, which are naturally hard, they melt when they're under softening power. But when the heat is withdrawn, they revert right back to their native hardness, and that would be my fear. So we come and we were melted. And then when we get away from the softening power of the cross work of Christ, we revert right back to our native hardness. Friends, if you don't understand the significance, the full significance of the Lord's table, it's got a lot to do about softening your heart and keeping you sensitive. As we come to the table this morning, let's remind ourselves that the best antidote against sin is to understand its nature, it's deceitful. And the best way to be kept from hardness is to be kept from sin. And the best way to be kept from turning back is to keep looking forward to Christ, to His Word, to His voice, and to His works. And the best way to escape the hardening of your heart is being often under the God-ordained means of softening it. Can I ask you, don't end up like Pietro Bandandelli? May it go on to the end. And may your countenance show not that you've lived a life of sin. But as you lie upon your deathbed, aged though you may be, marks and signs of years of labor and toil, may there be within your countenance a sight of one who has come into contact with the living God and who has known the fellowship that the fellowship is described in the gospel of Jesus Christ. May God give us sensitive hearts.